What's your minimum specification? Tens Tyrant 2016. I mean, at the time, Jim, I think you were working on Tesla on the self-driving mm -hmm. yep. stuff. When you were speaking with Lubija at the time, you know, was mm -hmm. did Lubija have a concrete vision at that point? You know, was it was was there something more than just who Lubija is that you know gave you the impetus yeah. to invest? Yeah, there was a couple of things. One is um, we're all in that process of discovery then about just how low a precision mathematics you needed to make neural networks work. And he had come up with a, a fairly novel um, variable precision floating point that was really dense per millimeter. And then he had an architecture of compute and data and then how we wanted to interconnect it, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. Um, he had pretty strong ideas about how that worked. Um, Pete Bannon and I talked to him a couple times while we were at Tesla. The engine he was building was actually more sophisticated than we needed. And we, yeah, the, the, you know, Pete was the architect of the AI engine and the Tesla chip. And it's brilliant for running CAFE. Um, just amazing. Like the, the compiler team for that chip was a half of Pete. Like literally. Yeah. Like it's, and because again, the hardware software match was so good. CAFE produced a pseudo instruction set, which you trivially modified to go run on the AI engine. And what Lebesia was doing was more sophisticated to run uh, lots of different kinds of programs. And Lebesia, at the time, were you already aiming at PyTorch? Or or were, that was before PyTorch was the winner. It was probably TensorFlow back then. Yeah, PyTorch was just called Torch still. Right. In, and uh, TensorFlow had just kind of started being hyped. So C Cafe was really the dominant framework. Right. At, at the time, and then TensorFlow was on the horizon, and PyTorch was not quite on the horizon right. as, as but, a dominant. But yeah. CAFE could describe more complex models, especially when you go into training. And the engine we wanted at Tesla didn't do that, so we built a simpler engine. Um, but he was already off to the races, and he could you know, show benchmarks and show good compute intensity and... You know, you guys had a hacked up version of software that actually did something useful. And you seem to be paying attention to the hardware software boundary even way early on the design. And I thought that was that was key. Yeah, we had a box that we were taking around and showing everybody in June, June 2016. And it was running neural networks end to end from Cafe on an FPGA and returning results. And uh, so it wasn't anything that you could sell, but it, it showed that, you know, like uh, we, we could basically bring up this thing end to end relatively quickly and that we had a bunch of ideas. I mean, ultimately all of our key focus, uh, focal points even now are essentially stuff that we, we wanted from the get go. So it's, it hasn't been a huge revolution in, in, you know, high level thinking since then it's been more just like a massive amount of execution. So that, that actually leads into, into a question about execution because you started off with this proof of concept jawbridge design in 2019. We've got six ten six cores, small one and a half one, I think you, you classified it as. And now you have a bigger uh, next gen chip called Grayskull, 120 cores, PCIe 4. And it's, it's, it's shipping to customers this year, I think. But yeah. mo most recent AI startups don't really publicize their proof of concept designs. So can you explain why it was important to have this, you know, fast follow on from the uh, you know, first mini chip to uh, Grayskull, which is now being sold? So, so there, there, there were two reasons why we why, why we went about, you know, our product roadmap the, the way we did. One was purely risk management. So it was, you know, new new team, no existing flows, no existing anything. We really had to flush the pipe and, you know, get something built so that all of the linkage of which there's there's you know like literally 50 steps that you need to kind of put in place to get that done can can be done and and we have it all working and we don't run a, a risk of sinking a pile of money in case there's a mistake uh, the the other motivation was that we believe pretty deeply that it's important to have the same architecture basically span from edge to to huge multi-chip multi-computer deployments in the cloud and the, the main reason why we think so is that as you go away from just running through a bunch of equations to implement a neural net and you get into 
more fancy things like runtime sparsity or dynamic computation or anything that tries to go away from the mindset of just crunch a bunch of multiplies, you know, the same multiplies every time, uh, you naturally run into compatibility dynamics. So we felt, so you end up with a situation where if you train something on, let's say an NVIDIA GPU, and it has a, you know, 2x sparsity feature in case you apply a certain set of constraints to your data, if you don't have a compat compatible piece of hardware, wherever you deploy this, so in a phone or, you know, like an edge device, uh, you lose that 2x, right? And the 2x is just going to grow in, in our uh, view anyway. So essentially, we felt it was a huge advantage to be able to clearly demonstrate that we can do a single watch chip, we can do a, you know, 60 watt chip, and we can do a data center full of our chips connected through, through Ethernet that's also on our chips. So when you look at this spectrum, the single watch chip was the easiest to do. So, you know, like it was, it was another point in favor of doing it. So we, we basically just went, it, it's, you know, a, a much less robust way of saying this. It's kind of crawl, walk, run, yeah. uh, but shows the whole spectrum. Yeah, and also, simple. you know, a lot of people spend a boatload of money on their first try. And, mm. you know, Grayskull is our third generation. We had a prototype in an FPGA and then a test chip and then yeah. Grayskull. And they learned a shitload on each step, both hardware and software. And it's reflected in the software stack. Like our software team is pretty small. I've seen a lot of software where AI companies, you know, they get a chip back and their plan to make it work is to hire 300 software people, right? Which means they don't have a plan really. Um, and, you know, that you can't really overcome that mismatch, mismatch in hardware software boundary with, you know, huge teams. Well, at some level you could, if you can throw a thousand people at it and some people are doing that. But, but that's not really the right way to do it. And that's not going to be something you can expose long run to programmers because the, the complexities are so high, it gets really fragile, right? And then the programmers can't see how the hardware works. Like one of the geniuses of Linux and open source software and running on x86 is the programmers could program the hardware right to the metal. Yeah. And they could see how it worked and it was obvious and you know, it was robust and it worked over time. And AI hardware that's too fragile to be exposed to the programmers, like the, not not all the programmers, but you know the experts.